Okay, so hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, we are starting this session with the presentation from Professor Sanjay Mukherjee, uh, professor from the Department of English and Comparative Literary Studies at Shaurastra University in India. And it is titled, Like a Tree Which Is Not and Like a River That Flows Not, Reading Poetry and Speculating Motifs. So Professor, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Thank you. I begin by thanking the Department of English and American Studies, CPU Nitra Slovakia. I have very fond memories of that place and all the people we met this May. And my department and all of us would always be very eager to collaborate in whatever way we can in academic activities with your department. And I hope when we have our events, we would want your collaboration too. With these words, uh, I begin reading my paper. Uh, like a tree which is not and a river that flows not, reading poetry, speculative motives. The two motives that I talk about, uh, the river represents portable water, water, and the tree representing vegetation. These two certainly were there much before human beings came on earth. And this is how I begin my paper. I begin with a starting question to myself, first of all, does ecocriticism have primarily an ideal or a pragmatic base? The line of this query follows the established opposition between idealism and pragmatism. The above question could be made more specific. Does green studies require a literary component? Does it not involve the disciplines of science, for example, pollution studies, geology, climatology, or philosophy, ethics, conflict resolution, or politics, policies and ratifications on climate crisis through bodies like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC, or even economics, climate investments for clean alternative energy by institutions like the World Bank and sociocultural history. Whereas the study of the relationship between literature and physical environment, which is a simple way of describing ecocriticism by those like Glotfelty, attempts to investigate through literary records that existed much before hardcore scientific data fundamental things like how has the concept of wilderness changed over time. The record of the primacy of literature before any other systematic discipline being beyond doubt, yet on the one hand, the idealist line of thought is accused by ecocritics of aestheticizing nature while helplessly looking or avoiding to look at its destruction by the same human agency. An example of this can be the famous Wordsworthian poem, Tintin Abbey, which does not mention the pollution of the River Wye and the rampant logging at the Tintin village at the time when this poem was written. On the other hand, and since poetry cannot simply be a reportage, there are ecocritics like Richard Kerridge who considered the significantly real or pragmatic contribution by the Romantics to raise the consciousness towards nature, simultaneously making us aware of the apposition and the binary opposition between nature and culture. What Kerridge says, I quote, ecocritics analyze the history of concepts such as nature in an attempt to understand the cultural developments that have led to the present global ecological crisis, unquote. The speaker in the poem, Tintin Abbey, an educated urban dweller by all means, is juxtaposed with a character hinted in the poem, a hermit who himself is not seen, but his trace is felt by the plume of smoke through the trees. Perhaps Wordsworth is dropping enough hints in this poem that the hermit in the 19th century is a romantic and not a real character. In fact, the speaker in the poem is not sure whether the smoke sent up in silence from among the trees is that of a hermit or of houseless vagrant dwellers 
have lost their homes attached to small patches of farmland due to rapid industrialization and have made the exodus to industrial towns of England. Perhaps there is enough hint of a warning in the poem that trees and rivers or large water bodies in the post-industrial 19th century can no longer be preserved. Yet, a contra reading of the same poem, especially in the light of the passionate first stanza with its exclamations by the speaker, who is very likely, as in most romantic poetry, the poet himself can easily make us interpret, as it is generally done, the sublimity of nature and the ecstasy the poet feels about it. <laughs> Wordsworth's collaborator in the Lyrical Ballads project and his friend Coleridge is one of the rare Western poets to have ascribed a river as sacred in his poem, Kubla Khan, although calling the poem a dream fragment. In contrast, rivers in India have always been regarded as sacred, about which this paper would return to a little later. A large sense of destruction is implied in Keats's poem, La Baldem Sans Mercy, if we take the night as the pronouncedly male human agency that desiccates vegetation, dries up the water bodies, causing the disappearance of the feminine nature and the non-human birds. This poem in turn, we ought to remember, becomes the inspiration for Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, with lines from it, the lines being, the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing, as one of the three epigraphs in it. This novel often being regarded as one of the earliest effective literary texts by ecocritics with its grim fourth chapter titled Surface Waters and Underground Seas, opening with the sentences, and I quote a few sentences from this novel. Of all our natural resources, water has become the most precious. By far, the greater part of the earth's surface is covered by its enveloping seas, yet in the midst of this plenty, we are in want. <clears throat> By a strange paradox, most of the Earth's abundant water is not usable for agriculture, industry, or human consumption because of its heavy load of sea salts. And so, most of the world's population is either experiencing or is threatened with critical shortages. In an age when man has forgotten his origins and is blind even to his most essential needs for survival, water, along with other resources, has become the victim of his indifference." Unquote. Silent Spring was published in 1962, and one can only dread at the salinity ingress statistics today, more than 60 years later, when, according to one report, 50% of India's arable land will become salt affected and thus infertile by 2050. I don't have the world statistics, but this is from India. 50% of India's arable land will become salt affected and thus infertile by 2050. Another prediction on water about the year 2050, and this is, this is made in 2022 with sufficient data, by the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that is NOAA, is about the near complete melting of the polar ice caps with the commensurate devastation of rising sea levels by 12 inches or more, habitat loss, global warming, and massive destabilization of food systems. Thus, keeping with the river motif and tracing the depiction of changes from the 16th to the 20th century, 20th century regarded by many eco-critics as the proper century of the Anthropocene, it is instructive to note that the river Thames, in its abundantly pastoral setting in Edmund Spencer's Prothalamian, becomes through the same lines, that is, sweet Thames run softly till I end my song. The same line in Spencer and now in Eliot, the line in 20th century Thames becomes filthy and polluted, sweating oil and tar, in the third section of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And by the last section of this poem, the aridity in nature and in human lives is complete with all trace of water gone. I read a few lines from The Wasteland. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, and water a spring, a pool among the rock, 
if there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip drop, drip drop, drop drop, drop, but there is no water. The disappearance of the river before it is choked by pollution is a reality expressed in 20th century literature and environmental discourse and contradicts the perception still held in the Victorian times where, for example, the river is still brimming, as in Tennyson's poem, The Brook, where the river, fed by the uphill streams, almost symbolizes time itself with the refrain, for men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. 20 years after the wasteland, the high modern Eliot would temper down, having taken refuge under Anglo-Catholicism and in the dry salvages, reveal a surprisingly flash of modern pantheism and yet accurately pin down the two defining traits of the 20th century, commerce and technology that have governed all human activity and since then been flagged often by ecological activists for feeding each other into an ever widening cycle of environmental destruction. I quote the opening lines from the dry salvages to make clearer my submission. I do not know much about gods, but I think that the river is a strong brown god, sullen, untamed and intractable, patient to some degree, at first recognized as a frontier, useful, untrustworthy as a conveyor of commerce, then only a problem confronting the builder of bridges. The problem once solved, the brown god is almost forgotten by the dwellers in cities, ever, however, implacable. Keeping his seasons and rages, destroyer, reminder of what men choose to forget." Unquote. At this juncture, a thought ought to be given to a form that preceded the romantic and modern poetry. We must not forget the pastoral, although this form is still found in the romantic period, with Wordsworth's Michael being a very prominent example. What is the pastoral, a form that ecocritics too mention prominently? One way of looking at the pastoral beyond the conventional where man lives in harmony with nature is through the lens of loss and nostalgia. It creates an idyllic scene that is irretrievably lost and perhaps hints at the fact that the symbiosis between man and nature perhaps never existed and human agency has wrested the pasture from the wilderness, shaping it as his backyard for the cattle he owns. The pastoral is a literary site suggesting the hierarchy of culture over nature. Greg Garrard, observing about the dual nature of this literary genre, opines that, and I quote, no other trope is so deeply entrenched in Western culture or so deeply problematic for environmentalism. With its roots in the classical period, pastoral has shown itself to be infinitely malleable for different political ends and potentially harmful in its tensions and evasions." Unquote. A good example of this kind of a deliberately ambiguous double speak is Marlowe's The Passionate Shepherd to His Love, where after being struck by the fact that an humble shepherd can never conjure up such a sophisticated piece of culture, that is the poem, perhaps the university which Marlowe knows this and is merely trying his hand with great finesse at a traditional poetic form, weaving the prominent Renaissance theme of secular love. Notice the sleight of hand with the keyword passion in the title of the poem itself, which can also mean the suffering shepherd, we also discover that the shepherd speaker seems surely to be some kind of a pastoral feudal lord owning land and labor for his own material comfort. It becomes quite clear from the poem that the shepherd speaker knows how to mine gold, process wool from sheep and hunt birds for the soft down feathers. So if the Renaissance pastoral rules the loss, the pastoral by the romantics confirms it and dreads the setting in of the industrialization and urbanization. Ecocriticism's critique of the pastoral not only charges the latter of a helpless lament, but also accuses it for exoticizing both humans and nature. 
Terry Gifford highlights just this aspect of the pastoral when he mentions that the pastoral, I quote, implies an idealization of rural life that obscures the realities of labor and hardship, unquote. Thus, all pastoral is romantic in the sense that it conjures the unattainable far away and the long ago. In fact, it is in this sense that a poem like Yeats's The Lake Isle of Innisfree signals the passing away of romanticism with the onset of modernity that further gets underlined through poems like Thomas Hardy's The Darkling Thrush, which also announces the death of the 19th century. And by the time we come to Ezra Pound's In a Station of the Metro, the monotonous and mechanical city life has inescapably enmeshed us all. The tree in that poem no longer sustains life. The rot has set in. It is, and I quote, a wet black bough, unquote. I shall like to move on to the second motive dealt in this paper, the tree, but not before mentioning a few Indian poems on the river. It has already been said that rivers in India are not just natural bodies. They constitute and are flowing examples of the ancient Indian pagan worldview, often epitomized in the Vedic mantra, Vasudheva Kutumbakam, meaning the world is one family, signifying both the human and the non-human in the phrase, the world. Every river in India, major or minor, has some mythical or legendary or folkloric narrative attached. And with the Ganga, these narratives would be the maximum. The most ancient of Indian texts mention the Ganga, and it is associated with each of the three most revered Hindu deities, the god of creation, the creator Brahma, the preserver god Vishnu, and the destroyer Shiva of all life in the universe. But modern Indian poems confront the ecological reality about all rivers, including the Ganga, considered the purest of all Indian rivers. Whether it is the poet Anamika who in her poem, Peljaghat and River Ganga, has the telling line, and I quote, wastelands all had once been a river, unquote. Or Lakshmi Kannan, who describes the polluted river in her poem, Ganga, through the lines, I quote, river Ganga rushed, herself sullied with decaying flowers, rags, recycled plastic and torn paper floating down her back. The muddied water flowed on nonchalantly, hardly aware of the filth, unquote. Or Kedarnath Singh, who has an ironic, non-reverential, and yet a very fond take on the river Ganga and the ancient city Varanasi on its banks, depicting in his poem Banaras, the unending burning of the dead by the Manikarnika Ghat on the Ganga, juxtaposed surreally by the clamor of the lamp-lit prayers chanted just a few meters away transforming Varanasi daily into, I quote from the poem, a magic city, partly in water, partly in mantras, partly in conches, partly in flower, partly in corpses, partly in sleep, unquote. And yet the diurnal nature of prayers and offerings by the riverbanks conducted through centuries has now degenerated into mere unthinking ritualism with all the spiritual and pagan potency going extinct long ago, as the poet mentions towards the end of this poem with a vivid imagery of a yogi in merely the posture of penance with the essence missing. I quote towards the end, offering water to an unseen sun for centuries, the city stands on one leg in water without knowing where its other leg is, I unquote. Perhaps the most striking observation about the environmental situation through Indian river poems in the second half of the 20th century is by the critic K. Sachidanandan, who has edited an anthology of Indian river poems titled The Golden Boat, opining on a poem called Once a River by the poet Navakanta Barua, Sachidanandan remarks how this poem is generic of what he says, the death of a river and its substitution by a desert. And then he states, suddenly we know we are face to face with our own time of wastelands and the degradation of the environment, which at a symbolic level also connotes the loss of love and kindness in the human world, unquote. 
Returning to the motive of the tree, we can embark from pounds in a station of the metro, as mentioned earlier to, earlier, to a poem like Fern Hill by Dylan Thomas, noticing how wilderness has been harnessed into cultivated orchards. And towards the end of this poem, the speaker not only laments the loss of his golden childhood, but comes to the realization that the space of the orchard that was almost the size of a kingdom when he was a boy has shrunk to insignificance. Between Pound and Eliot's poems in the 1920s and Dylan Thomas's in the 1940s, we ought to remember the pylon poets of the 19, 19 uh, Pound and Eliot 20s, Dylan Thomas in the 40s, and the pylon poets in between the, of the 30s, and especially Stephen Spender's poem, The Pylons, which records the irreversible degradation of the English village landscapes with the onset of the electrical pylons and bemoans the passing away of a whole way of rural life. I quote a few lines from pylons. Now over these small hills built the concrete that trails black wire pylons. Those pillars bear like new giant girls that have no secret. The valley with its gilt and evening look and the green chestnut of customary root are mocked dry like the parched bed of a brook, unquote. I shall draw another short trajectory now, this time from Indian poetry in English. From an eco-critical point of view, Indian poetry written originally in English can be seen through the motif of a tree beginning from Toru Dutt's Our Casuarina Tree to Jeev Patel's On Killing a Tree. This is the trajectory of the majestic presence of a tree as a tree and not symbolic of anything cultural or spiritual to the absence of a tree through deliberate human action. And since these might not be familiar to non-Indian readers, I put these two poems entirely side by side in my paper. The first one, bearing the influence of the English Renaissance and the Romantic traditions and written in a measured verse and ornate diction was published in 1881. It portrays the grandeur of the tree and even suggests a deep familiarity with it and bears a strong tinge of nostalgia when the speaker realizes that the tree would outlast her by many years and clearly hints that only time can see the end of the tree. The second poem, in a matter of fact, direct language and conversational tone was published in the year 1966 and describes nonchalantly the process of exterminating trees by human agency. I shall read the second poem. This is On Killing a Tree by Jeev Patel, 1966. It takes much time to kill a tree. Not a simple jab of the knife will do it. It has grown slowly, consuming the earth, rising out of it, feeding upon its crust, absorbing years of sunlight, air, water, and out of its leprous hide, sprouting leaves. So hack and chop, but this alone won't do it. Not so much pain will do it. The bleeding bark will heal, and from close to the ground will rise curled green twigs, miniature boughs, which, if unchecked, will expand again to form a size. No, the root is to be pulled out, out of the anchoring earth. It is to be roped, tied and pulled out, snapped out or pulled out entirely out from the earth cave and the strength of the tree exposed. The source, white and wet, the most sensitive, hidden for years inside the earth. Then the matter of scorching and choking in sun and air, browning, hardening, twisting, withering, and then it is done. This is the poem. As a conclusion to this paper, I would submit, recollecting the question I had put forth in the beginning, what use is literature in saving the environment? It does not have scientific or technological knowledge to devise ways to mitigate the harm or invent newer eco-friendly materials nor does it have the know-how of artificial intelligence modeling that can simulate conditions of the Earth's core or its crust or its atmosphere or its ionosphere or even its climate to bring forth predictive data that can be used to implement corrective action towards, say, for example, greenhouse gas emission. However, 
reading poetry, one of the earliest domains of knowledge in the human civilization, brings one to the realization that if poetry has long been associated with mythopia or myth-making, then it is poetry again that is an effective agent of myth-breaking, making us stare at the harsh realities in a way that is so effective that it makes humans then to turn towards other domains of knowledge that can assist in making our rivers flow and our trees grow once again, so that poetry and the other arts are once again possible, so that nature acts as a catalyst for love to sprout in the human heart once more. Human beings can destroy nature, can conserve nature, or what seems well nigh impossible can let nature be. But without poetry, who will remember or recollect nature? Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions? Okay, Maria. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Professor, thank you a lot for this very insightful and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, as I was following your thoughts, um, there was a question that came to my mind regarding the man's destructive behavior towards the world around us. And that is, do you think that it can be related to the lack of spiritual outlook in modern culture also? And, or, or could it be related to the decline uh, of spirituality in general? And what I mean, what I mean by spirituality is, is that belief in sort of um, embracing the idea of the whole creation, like something that would be close to mystical vision of the world as sacred. You also mentioned that in Indian culture, the rivers are sacred. Yeah. So sacredness is there in the air in your culture. Uh, so my question would be whether, what is your view on this? Whether you can see it as related? And if yes, what does it mean for us? And what does it mean for poetry? This is a very a question that would require for probably a seminar to discuss. Uh, yes, uh, I mentioned not only that uh, natural bodies like trees are venerated and rivers are sacred in India, and it would be, I suppose, in many cultures uh, before. Uh, Really, I, I also mean to say that before really the very, very scientific industrial material world set in. I'm also aware that even in India, there are many people who in a very ritualistic manner, and that is what the poets are highlighting, they have lost the contact of spirituality and they, are, they merely follow the cycle of rituals. So, and the cycle of rituals uh, are grand if the material for the prayer ceremony is grand, you know, not because the heart wants it so. So this is a dichotomy that is, that is regularly seen everywhere. I keep on seeing that in India. Uh, and where that is why, I mean, I mentioned that Vedic mantra also that the world is one family and the world includes the, the human world and the non-human world also. And this aspect of uh, encompassing life, even, even uh, mountains which are scientifically rocks, so they are non-living. But, you know, Rocks are venerated They're here, I mean, in, in, in many cultures, therefore, but that there, there is some disconnect of consciousness towards this, that is, and that is where you see the, the post 1950s Indian poets, they time and again, uh, my emphasis was on, 
quite a bit of Indian poetry, I felt, and Indian poetry originally written in English. That also has a long tradition. Uh, where you can see that they are being realistic about uh, the rituals. They are being realistic about natural resources that on one hand they are venerated, on the other they are, they, they are mindlessly polluted. So this is, are we, are we uh, lacking a spiritual quotient? I think that could be a, a thing that could be a very significant observation. Uh, can literature and poetry help us? I believe so. That is how I have ended my paper. I believe it can. We are we are uh, uh, we are emphasizing too much on what is called in India science, technology, engineering, and mathematics (STEM) disciplines of knowledge. And some of us have been asking that instead of STEM, there has to be an A, STEM science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. So not just STEM, but STEAM. We, have, we are losing STEAM. We are losing our spiritual fervor, I suppose. Very, very, very significant observation. Uh, I think this is what I, the way I would respond to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will send the paper to you, uh, of course. And I will just... Uh, write down some of the references it is almost done and i would certainly like your observations after you read the paper also okay good thank you any other questions it seems like not so thank you for the presentation and 